Hey y'all, check this out. Today on Halloween, we summon a Swedish legend from the aviation afterlife, a jet so ahead of its time, it's still haunting Russian pilots 70 years later. Now, I may have been a former infantryman, but my heart belongs to air power, which is probably why I left the army after six years and joined the Air Force. So indulge me in this deep dive into a lesser known Swedish interceptor called the J-35 Draken. After all, this mythical beast laid the groundwork for another mythical modern marvel, the Gripen. Hey friends, Wes here, American veteran of two branches, ride or die Ukraine supporter, and obvious sob stan. In the 1950s, while the rest of Europe was still trying to glue fins on leftover propeller planes, Sweden decided to build something that looked like it came from Flash Gordon. The Saab J-35 Draken looked like it had overshot the timeline completely. Born in the crucible of the Cold War paranoia, the Draken, or Dragon, was Sweden's answer to a problem no one else was brave enough to solve. How to intercept Soviet bombers at Mach 2 and do it from highways. Yep, highways. The Swedes didn't have sprawling bases like NATO, and they figured those would be the first things nuked anyways. So they wanted fighters that could take off from rural roads, let the pilot take a leap behind a pine tree, and get back into the fight before the Soviets could even refuel. Saab's engineers, equal parts genius and lunatic, accepted the challenge. Design a supersonic interceptor that could hit Mach 2, land on a farm road, and still make it home for dinner. Saab's engineers could have played it safe. They could have copied an F-100 Super Sabre or bolted on a tail like everyone else, but this was Sweden in the 1950s, a country that looked at the laws of aerodynamics and said, let's see how much we can push them. The double delta wing was the result of that mischief. Instead of one consistent sweep angle, the Draken's wing had two, a sharply swept intersection for high-speed flight and a shallower outer section for control at low speeds. The idea was simple in theory and terrifying in practice. At Mach 2, the inner wing kept the aircraft stable and slick through the air. When the Draken slowed down for landing, the outer wing took over, providing lift and control so it didn't drop out of the sky like a brick. No one had ever flown a full-scale fighter with this configuration before. Wind tunnel data offered hints, but not guarantees. Every engineer knew that one bad assumption about airflow separation or vortex lift could turn a project into a taxpayer-funded crater. Still, Saab pressed ahead, part national pride, part Nordic stubbornness. The results were astonishing. The Draken's double delta produced powerful leading-edge vortices that clung to the wing even at extreme angles of attack. In other words, when other aircraft were begging for mercy at a high pitch, the Draken was still flying. That same vortex lift, discovered by accident, later inspired advanced wing designs on jets like the F-16 and the Raphael. Even the airframe's strength bordered on absurd. Its wing route had to handle both high-speed compressive forces and low-speed flex, something most designs treated as mutually exclusive. Saab's solution was an internal structure so overbuilt it could have survived a nuclear blast. It gave the Draken an almost comical durability. Pilots joked that you could land it on gravel, sweep the bugs off, and fly it again before Fika. By the way, Fika is my new Swedish obsession. It's basically a social ritual of pausing work to socialize with coffee or tea and a sweet treat like a pastry. Okay, the double delta also gave Sweden something priceless, independence. It meant they didn't need to buy fighters from the US or even the Soviet Union. They built their own supersonic aircraft from scratch with no blueprints, no imported design language, and no backup plan if it failed. And yet it worked beautifully, defiantly, and decades ahead of its time. What began as an experiment in geometry ended as a masterclass in controlled chaos and a warning to the rest of the aviation world that Swedish innovation was already flying past. Now, every now and then, aviation progress takes a wrong turn and stumbles into brilliance. The Saab J-35 Draken's discovery of the Cobra maneuver is one of those moments where physics and luck share to smoke at the smoke pit. During early test flights, Swedish pilots noticed something peculiar. When the Draken pitched its nose up at high angles of attack, it didn't snap into a violent stall like 
every textbook said it should. Instead, it paused, nose pointed skyward, hanging in the air for a fraction of a second before calmly recovering. That wasn't supposed to happen. In aerodynamics, that's like watching a penguin hover mid-air. It defied everything pilots had been taught. The engineers called it court parade or short parry. To them, it was just one more weird quirk of their double delta experiment. But in practice, they'd stumbled on one of the most dynamic and tactically valuable maneuvers in aviation history. At extreme angles of attack, most fighters lose lift and spin out. The Draken, thanks to those powerful leading edge vortices generated by its double delta wings, could maintain controlled flight even when airflow over the wings should have been completely chaotic. Pilots realized they could intentionally pitch the nose up to ridiculous angles, slow down almost instantly, and then drop the nose back to re-engage, effectively slamming on the air brakes mid-air. In combat terms, that meant a pursuing fighter could overshoot, flying right past the Draken and into its gun sight. This is it, Maverick! I'm gonna hit the brakes, he'll fly right by. Shit, he's gonna get a lock on us! Oh. Now that kind of agility was unheard of in the 1950s, when most interceptors were designed for straight-line speed, not dogfighting finesse. Of course, the Swedes didn't parade the discovery around. The Cobra wasn't yet a performance move, it was a recovery technique a way to regain control during high alpha stalls. But decades later, when Soviet pilots performed the same maneuver deliberately in their Su-27s, the world called it revolutionary. Saab engineers just nodded quietly and thought, yeah, we tried that 30 years ago. The truth is that Draken's Cobra wasn't a stunt. It was a survival instinct. It was born from pilots wrestling with an unpredictable airframe and finding poetry in its chaos. What later became an airshow crowd pleaser began as a desperate trick to stay alive in a machine that broke all the rules, and then rewrote them. That moment, when a Swedish jet stood on its tail and refused to die, cemented the Draken's place in history, not just as an interceptor, but as the first aircraft to show the world that aerodynamic limits were only suggestions. The J-35 Draken was built for the end of the world, or at least that's the version of it that the Swedes were planning to survive. During the Cold War, Sweden knew it stood uncomfortably close to the Soviet Union's flight paths. The assumption wasn't if Soviet bombers came over the Baltic, it was when. So Swedish defense planners developed a doctrine known as BAS-60 and later BAS-90, a dispersed airbase system designed to keep the Air Force alive after the first nuclear strike. It's very similar to what Ukraine is doing right now with their F-16s and what the U.S. is trying to do with its agile combat employment. Now, the philosophy was simple. Don't rely on big, beautiful airfields that make convenient nuke targets. Instead, scatter small units of jets across highways, forest clearings, and rural roads. That's why the Draken was built like a post-apocalyptic survivalist zombie hunter's dream. The aircraft's layout allowed crews to reload missiles and fuel simultaneously, a design quirk that came from the expectation of fighting under nuclear fallout. Pilots were trained to scramble from roadside shelters, launch in pairs, and engage Soviet bombers before they reach Swedish airspace. Then they land on a different road strip miles away, rearm, and do it again. This doctrine made the Draken less of an aircraft and more of a survival mechanism. It was designed for autonomy. Each aircraft, its own miniature airbase. If command centers were destroyed, if communications were jammed, the Draken could still operate on visual signals and pre-brief routes. In a grimly practical sense, Sweden built a fighter that assumed civilization might not be there when it landed. It's also why the cockpit and systems were simple but smart. Pilots could operate everything in gloves and a gas mask, and the analog gauges wouldn't be fried by EMPs. Even the radar system was hardened for rough environments, giving the Draken just enough independence to hunt without babysitting from ground control. In NATO terms, it was a nightmare opponent, silent, dispersed, and very hard to eliminate. The Swedes had essentially built an air force that could keep fighting in the smoking remains of a world war. When you think of the Draken as a Cold War weapon, it makes perfect sense. It wasn't a trophy aircraft. It was a lifeboat with afterburners. And in that sense, it was perfectly Swedish. It was practical, unsentimental, 
and quietly brilliant in its preparation for the worst. Every modern Swedish fighter jet, from the Viggen to the Gripen, carries a bit of Draken DNA. The J-35 was a philosophy in aluminum, a statement that small nations could punch well above their industrial weight if they outthought instead of outspent. When the Draken entered service, it taught Sweden two lessons that would define its entire aerospace industry for decades. First, independence mattered more than imitation. Second, every jet had to be tailored to Sweden's geography, doctrine, and politics. Not America's, not Russia's. The Viggen, which followed in the 1970s, took the Draken's dispersed operations concept and ran with it. Where the Draken proved a fighter could land on a highway, the Viggen made it routine. It could land, it could refuel, and it could take off again in less than 10 minutes. Sometimes from roads barely long enough to park a semi. And under the skin, its avionics and its design were direct descendants of the aerodynamic principles Saab had pioneered with the Draken's double delta. Then came the Gripen. If the Draken was a Cold War survivor, the Gripen became its digital Gen X Air. Compact, agile, and built for the same road-based doctrine. It was the first true information age fighter. Networked, software defined, and easy to maintain. Saab engineers designed it with the same minimalist genius that made the Draken special. One mechanic, one toolbox, and a patch of road were still all you needed. Even the design philosophy carried over. Like its ancestor, the Gripen emphasized efficiency over brute force. It didn't need twin engines. It doesn't need stealth coatings that cost more than the jet itself. It needed to work in a Scandinavian winter, in a war that might last weeks, not days. The same rugged, self-reliant DNA that let the Draken operate after a nuclear strike now lets the Gripen fight in a drone-saturated electronic battlefield. And there's a poetic symmetry here. The Draken was conceived at a time when Sweden stood alone between two nuclear superpowers. The Gripen was born in an era when Sweden again found itself staring down Russian aggression across the Baltic. The names changed, the threats evolved, but the lessons have stayed the same. Survival depends on adaptability, not abundance. So when modern pilots fire up a grip in E, they're flying 70 years of Swedish defiance. An unbroken lineage began when a handful of engineers decided to make a fighter that looked impossible and flew beautifully. The Draken gave birth to an attitude. In the end, that's the real legacy of the Dragon. It taught Sweden that its best defense isn't size or numbers, it's brains and grit. The J-35 Draken never fired a shot in anger, but it didn't have to. It did something rarer. It kept the peace by being just dangerous enough. It taught Western engineers that aerodynamic bravery could work. It gave birth to a maneuver that would define modern air shows, and it set Saab on a path that would eventually produce one of the best multi-role fighters in the world, the Gripen. For a jet built in a country best known for meatballs and neutrality, the Draken story is one of audacious innovation. It was fast, it was elegant, and just a little bit weird like all the best things Sweden never made. And when you watch a Gripen pull a tight, high-G turn today, you're seeing a ghost from 1955 smiling in the vapor trail. That's the Dragon's legacy. That's it for today, my friends. Obviously, I'm smitten with Sweden's tech ability, which is why I fawn over jets like the Gripen and the Draken. I'm just glad they're on our side. Subscribing here is the best free way to support these videos. I'll make a deal with you. I'll keep making videos if you keep showing up to watch them. And as always, glory to Ukraine, glory to the heroes, Crimea is Ukraine.